Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Shana Powell, naturopathic doctor and owner of West Oaks Wellness here in Montrose, Colorado. This week my special guest is a local beekeeper and passive solar uh, connoisseur, um, Glenn Alberg, and I'll let him introduce himself and we're going to talk about some interesting structural and you know maybe we'll talk about bees. We'll see how this goes. Sounds like a plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. My name is Glenn Alberg. Uh, Born and raised in the valley. Yeah. Went around the world, came back. So, you know. And that's, you know, uh, people go seek out gurus, right? All over the, all the well, time. And yeah. they realize they go to like these faraway places and realize that they could find the same thing they were looking for where they were from. Yeah. That's, you know, part of the beautiful experience of traveling. Oh. Right. Um, so. When I came, when I got introduced to you, it was through Unca Padre Beef, uh, Brittany mm -hmm. Duffy. So yep. thank her, thank you, Brittany, for an introduction. Um, I was looking for a beekeeper. I wanted to learn a little bit more about bees and understand them because there's quite a bit of die-off that's happening. The amount of honey that's being consumed right now in the world market is like significantly more, and there's been a huge die-off since the '90s of bees. So I had all these questions of like, well, how how is that possible? And unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think there's fraudulent honey which is a harsh reality, which is not the case for you. No. Um, and when we were chatting, we got, you were like, okay, I'm really excited about this passive solar thing. And one of the things I like to share with my guests is how can we harness not only local resources, but other things with relatively inexpense or free that can be very valuable to us. And the cost of utilities isn't going down anytime soon. <laughs> and passive solar is a great way to um, not have one overpriced solar panels and to, you know, save yourself heating and uh, cooling bills in the summer. Can you tell us a little bit more about sure. how you got started in that? Sure. Um, way back in the 70s, I started looking into solar and, and the first thing that came out, out of that was the passive solar side of things. Um, which is nothing more than south-facing windows. It's as simple as it gets. Okay. Um, they, uh, you, you, there's an overheating side of things that happens in the fall this time of year mm -hmm. because the sun angle is falling and the days are not, we're not into the heating side of the season yet, but the seasons always fall behind the sun angle. Mm -hmm. So in the fall, you end up with a little bit of an overheating and in the spring, it's always short. Um, Part of the way to get a, keep that from happening is is I've built two places with with a trump what they call a trome wall, mm -hmm. which is nothing more than a heavy uh, mass that that's behind glass. Which so that when the sun comes through and shines on this mass, that it's slow to warm up, but it's also slow to give it up, mm -hmm. and it's inside the building, mm -hmm. which is that's what you want. So it's kind of like a wall and like your, wall. your property, I saw, I was like, I think you said it was an eight inch concrete eight, wall. Eight inch thick concrete wall that's two feet behind the glass. Okay. And uh, works really well. So it's like radiation. It is radiation. We're using, gathering the energy from the sun and it's being held in that wall to either keep a room cooler or warmer in the winter time. Yeah. It, it keeps it cooler in the summertime because it is it is setting down into the ground and the ground temperature is somewhere around 55 60 degrees year mm -hmm. round so that concrete wall acts as a wick both up and down aha uh -huh. so that so that in the summertime the heat that that shines on it of course i have overhang on the on the glass so that you don't get any sun in there in the summertime Right. It's hotter in the middle of winter than it is ever in the summer <laughs> <laughs> which is okay that's mm -hmm. what it's about yeah absolutely um but uh, works really good. Both the heat goes both ways. Do you have to use concrete, or can you use other you types can, of material? You can, as long as it's it's mass. Okay. It could be it could be any number of things. Years ago, they looked into the different salts and and water. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Salts so uh, like uh, magnesium chloride. Like, what do you mean? The, the, uh, they could be stone. It could be, but the salts they they, they have what salts that, that change from liquid to, to solids mm. that absorb heat and give up heat. Right. But 
You don't have to go that way. I mean, I'm a simple guy. Yeah, keep things simple. No, I mean, keep it simple. Accessible too, and like yes. some of these other, like hempcrete and these other like natural building materials tend to be quite expensive. They do well, but but they also have a tendency to be used for exterior walls, so that they need mm. an R value to them. What you're after is this mass, strictly mass, something that is slow to warm up, that absorbs that heat, but mm -hmm. it also radiates it back out. And this wall is two feet in from the, the, the glazing, the glass, and it's an eight inch thick wall. And as the, as the heat up, heats up on one side, as that heat travels through that wall, it comes out the other side eight hours later. Interesting. So it comes out in the middle of winter, not, or middle of night, or in the, in, when you need the heat. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it like it dissipates is. naturally. Yeah. Without like, a, like if it's kind of, I'm kind of thinking I describe super saturated solutions to some of my patients pretty mm -hmm. regularly. And it, this is kind of like that is like as the room cools down or warms up, the wall will either cool down or warm up the room. Yes. To, yes. In like to yes. balance that ratio out. Well, the, the heat always travels to cool, always. Okay. It always goes that direction. Cool never goes the other way. Heat always goes, regardless of what the temperature is. It's always going one direction. So when it's warmer in the daytime, when the sun is shining on this thing, and that heat is going into that wall, as it cools off here, it starts to radiate it back out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something a moment ago you said the natural building materials like the hempcrete Mm -hmm. They are used for exterior walls, whereas this is an interior wall. And they, yes. you mentioned something called an R value. Yep. Is this something to make it structurally sound? R value is, is a resistance to the movement of heat. I see. It's the insulation value mm -hmm. that, that is in all. I mean, it's the first rule in any building is once you keep it, either the heat or the cold is to retain it there. Don't let it back out. Whatever whatever environment you're trying to create, sure. Don't you know? You don't open the window in the middle of winter, so because you lose. Right. But you also have make sure that you have this R value walls, the insulating value, to keep from losing that heat back to the outside. Same thing in the summertime mm -hmm. is you don't want the heat in. So the first thing you do either direction is to keep. Keep your, your resistance to the, the movement of your heat mm -hmm. or cold in or out. That, that's, that's conservation. That's just the right. first thing you do. That makes sense. Right. And like the, this is the difference between older buildings and newer buildings. Sure. Like I've definitely been in some turn of the century, 20th, <laughs> 20th century houses, and they are not nearly as structurally no. sound no. as like this house, which is built in the 70s. Yeah. And it's, you know, you can't feel wind blowing through it. Right. But they build better houses today than they did in the 70s when this For was. For sure. Yes. Yeah. There's some negative downfall to that as well. Um, yes. If you've ever heard of sick building syndrome. Sure. sure. And the, the building materials that we use, while maybe they are a little more eco-friendly, quote unquote, you know, again, pros and cons there. We'll save that for a, con a different conversation. A lot of these buildings, they don't have open windows. They're made mm -hmm. with like cheaper particle board Ugh, materials and they off gas yep. and I've seen a number of patients both when I was a student and in my practice here in Montrose that have been quite sick because their buildings don't have the ability to kind mm -hmm. of like breathe a little they're, bit they're, they're too tight they're too tight exactly yes. Yes. so there's pros and cons to all of that yes there are do I appreciate not having wind blowing through my house in the winter time absolutely <laughs> But I think a 70s house versus the modern, like I'm thinking like office buildings specifically because mm -hmm. they tend to be the ones that don't have windows that open and close, well, which is kind of scary. Mechanical systems have, have improved with all of that. Yeah. There was a time whenever they were going, you know, we're going to build these houses to where they, they are just completely airtight and they put in these air-to-air -air heat exchangers so that they would breathe mm -hmm. mechanically. Well... If the mechanics ever failed, then, then you got into what you're talking about. Yeah. The, the, the env interior environment of this thing was toxic. I mean, with yeah. all of the, everything that goes on in it. Yeah. Um, but now they've got to where they, the, some of the, the, particularly the, oh, the heating and air conditioning side of things, they use exterior air, outside mm -hmm. air, to, to temper and, and to breathe mm -hmm. within the systems, which is not, not unlike the air-to-air -air heat exchangers. Right. But they... They do a better job. For sure. All the mechanical side of things has evolved better, too. Absolutely. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's 
better that we have access to those things and yeah. you know you, you you've come to my house when I've just remodeled and like we took carpet out and carpet is a very well-known source of plastics and God only knows what else. Yeah, like, everything else that grows in there. <laughs> so gross. And I, I mean, you can spend the money and get wool carpet, but it is a lot of money and it is maintenance, more maintenance mm -hmm. than taking care of plastic based carpet. But the off gassing of carpet takes months, sometimes years, depending on how toxic it is and you know i again i tend to be on the more sensitive side of things but i this is what i see clinically and like whether we have access to open what were you calling it open exhaust systems that open to the external environment which is necessary it, and we're fortunate where we live because well we're not living in la true yeah <laughs> we have generally pretty clean air like we've had a couple fires this summer where they were affecting our air quality but not that bad. No, we and we generally have those. I mean, they, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. So, how did you first learn about trauma walls? I was reading an awful lot. I took uh, a lot of classes when I first got into solar. There were no manuals, so to speak, particularly with the active solar side of things. Okay. Um, so it was in the infancy of of that educational side of things to where the the college. Uh, or the instructional side of things, were, the textbooks were just being developed. Mm -hmm. So I got into the to reading a lot of these textbook side of things, and and all of the different systems that were out there interested me mm -hmm. a lot. And then I I just naturally gravitated towards the passive solar side of things because it it's as free as the sunshine. <laughs> Maybe with a, a little small fan or something, if you really think you need it to to move some air. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it is, and that's also why you don't see a lot of it, or because nobody can commercialize it very right. well. <laughs> so right, you you can't continually make money, and this is one yeah. of my problems I have with like solar panels. One, they're huge, and like I don't really want them on my roof. So then I have to take up land, and I don't really want to do that either. Plus. <laughs> They have a life. They have a finite lifespan. They do. I mean, I, I have both. I have all three. Yeah. I have passive solar, active solar. I have thermal solar. Oh. Which, which is the heating of hot water. Right. Th thermal panels as well as PV. So I have all three systems uh -huh. within my house. And have you found that the solar panels kind of have like a finite lifespan to them? Their efficiency goes down in time. Okay. But it. It doesn't ever just go away. Well, that's nice it, to it, know. It, it, it always it always has a, I mean the the life curve of them is definitely down, but it really flattens off after after four or five years. Sure. So, kind of plateaus, so it kind yeah, of stays yeah. like they have a capacity that's maintainable. Yes. Well, that makes me feel better because I know there's a lot of material that goes into building them. Oh yeah, they're, they're, almost all of the materials that the. the the energy stuff that we have today that they're relying on for creating, making electricity are not really that great. I yeah. mean, wind power, PV systems, they, they all have a, a huge outlay initially that takes years to be able to get back to where there is. It's a zero. Zero, yeah. What, what's PV? Photovoltaics. Photo Le electric on the roof. What? Electric on the roof. Photovoltaics. Okay. That's solar panels on the roof. Solar panels. Yeah, okay. But there's but there's thermal solar panels that are on the roof too. Interesting. That, inter that, that circulate water or glycol okay. through the system and take it down and put the heat that is from the solar panel into a storage. In my case, it's water. Sure. But it can also be into a concrete floor. Okay. I mean, there, there's, there's lots of ways to store that heat once the sun is shining on it. Or, right, because we do. We've got a hot sun. Oh, Even like, you know... It's, we live in a, <laughs> 300 days of sun a year. This is great. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, I didn't know that there were just two different types of solar panels. Oh, yeah. So, photo, voton. Votake. Votake. And then this, like, heat absorption. Mm -hmm. And is there... Are they built some, structurally somewhat similar? No. No. Different. To totally different. Totally different. Okay. Less expensive to have the ones that absorb heat. I'm sure they are. Okay. Yeah, but they're made out of copper. Okay. Which is which relatively and, and, expensive yeah, material. Kind of expensive, uh, but they literally, as long as they don't freeze. I mean, that would be the benefit of glycol as opposed to water. Glycol, right? yes. You okay. have to you have to use in this 
country you have to, this where it freezes and thaws you have to have some some way to keep it from from bursting the, the sure. panels okay so you collect it it goes into a storage tank so mm -hmm. you could have radiant floors or in your case you have like a water reservoir mm -hmm. any other things that people tend to use to kind of like hold that energy typically that's it okay basically uh, That'd be pretty nice to have in floor radiant heat that you collected from the sun on the roof. Well, once again, <laughs> once again, it's it's not unlike that trome wall, except this mm -hmm. is mechanical. Mm -hmm. Now we've taken the as opposed to just the sun shining on this wall. Now we have tubes that are in the slab, mm -hmm. but it's still that mass that is absorbing that heat and then radiates it back out. So okay, so you have to have some kind of collect, like some kind of way to collect it from the roof and put it down someplace else. Like, mm -hmm. is it some kind of piping system? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. with a pump. Uh, the pumps typically, oh, somewhere around seven tenths of an amp, about the about as much as the the old style light bulbs, okay. hundred watt light bulb. Okay. <laughs> Takes about that same amount of electricity. There's uh, the controls, or what they call differential temperature controllers, mm -hmm. which means that if the sun is, if it, if it warms up this panel to 15 degrees above whatever the storage temperature is, the turns the pumps on. Okay, interesting. And when it gets to within a certain, you know, four or five, when the sun goes down, or yeah. uh, and those temperatures come together, it shuts the system off. To where it's the, the it's always cheaper to move heat than it is to generate it. Okay. Always. Interesting. <laughs> because heat is energy, heat moves. Heat, heat is energy. Right, yep. right. And I'm thinking again back to like my general chemistry class where it's like when you have something that's hot, they're moving really quickly and so they have energy to dissipate that's off. What, that's why I said heat mm -hmm. always travels to cool because mm -hmm. it's the molecular energy. Yep. And when they start to cool down, or not move so fast as they're cooling down. Yeah, So and they sense. always. <laughs> so. Yeah. See, like just having like a basic understanding of things yeah. and like I'm not the most physics oriented person. That was a hard class either. for me. But like this is just basic understanding. Like this is gen general chemistry yes. 101 and understanding some basic principles that are applicable and applicable to real life situations, not the crap they taught us in school. <laughs> well, it's, it's, keep it simple. <laughs> keep it, it simple. It, it, yes. It's where I come from. I mean, really mm -hmm. keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. So this has been interesting. Um, storing energy and it's cheaper to move heat than it is to make heat that makes sense mm -hmm. and we're fortunate where we live because the sun is hot it's like yes. 70 degrees and you're like ah yeah. like burning up um okay what else uh, there was something actually you shared with me about trauma walls that i thought was really interesting i mean especially within the area we live in in the southwestern united states you had talked about this is how the adobe people sure kept their homes their huts warm and the, cool the, the, the cliff dwellings mm -hmm. are all facing south with overhangs as the sun angle goes down because that's what a lot of people don't understand. I mean, they know it, but they don't know it. Yeah, conceptually. If the sun angle goes up and down, right? and, and as it comes down, the, the sun angle would come back into these caves, these overhangs, and, and shine on those rock walls, mm -hmm. which kept them warmer. And mm -hmm. yet in the summertime, when the sun angle is over, it's cooler. Just, I mean, it's... So this is like talking like Mesa Verde, that Mesa national Verde. park down yep. by Durango, yep. right? And like this is... Yep. Are there any other cliff, cliff dwellings? That's the oh, only one they're I've, everywhere. Yeah, for sure. You get down on, on the on the Four Corners area, they are everywhere. Mm -hmm. They, they, which was, I mean, once again, these people that lived back then were pretty simple and they, they go, well, this is warmer and this is colder. I mean, right. <laughs> we, we, we go to where it's warmer and that's where they made their structures. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. And again, when we say simple, that doesn't necessarily mean easy. And oh, it no. also doesn't mean because like, I think I feel like one of the flaws of modern humans is we want things to be so damn complicated. It can't yeah. be that simple, <laughs> yeah. but actually simple is, and I think it's Occam's razor where he talks about like, if you have between two options, the more complicated and the simple, always go with the simpler I, option. I would, I would say that. I don't know. But yes, yeah. but I, I'm just, there's less things to go wrong with simple things. Definitely. Eight inch concrete wall, two foot <laughs> space with windows facing the south yep. and a little overhang to protect yourself in the summertime. Seems pretty simple. I'm not a structural engineer, but I know enough people that could like <laughs> probably help get me in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, 
there's an old rule of the thumb saying with passive solar is that you take as all of the glass off the north side. Okay. Because glass has an R value of two. Heat goes and cold goes right through it. Sure. So you take it off of the north side and you put it on the south, square footage wise. Okay. You take half of it on the east and half on the west and it goes on the south. So you've minimized the, the amount of heat loss mm -hmm. because our west sun can cook you in the summertime. It yeah. is brutal. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> so that is a heat gain at the last thing that you have during the day when you're trying to go to bed and, it's, and stay cool mm -hmm. and it just cooks everything on the west side. So you, you're removing that source of, and moving it to the south. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of reminding me a little bit of like some permaculture values as well. Like you want to make sure that you're using the sun appropriately. So again, this is, goes back to simple concepts. Like we need to be able to observe our environment. Where does the sun rise? Where does it set? And like, how is our, our house facing oriented? Oh. I think this is south because our driveway in the wintertime, we don't have to shovel. No. It's right. so great. Yes. It's I have a pet peeve about developments in general. They should be set up north and south mm -hmm. so that the people who are building the houses or that want to use the, the sun have that option. Yeah. If you're turning them 45 degrees to... You've, you've taken away from people's option of being yeah. able to do that. Right. Well, and I would say most people don't know. They don't. And but... then it will take away the beauty of the development, whatever <laughs> yeah. that means, the McMansions yeah. that yeah, are going well. in. Right. Yeah, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but, you know, the, the fact is, is that I want people to know that there are these options available to them. And we live, we're in Montrose County. Yes. Delta County I know there's a lot of politics and shenanigans going on there, but Delta County is one of two counties in Colorado that don't have building codes. Yep. There's pros and cons to that. There's, you know, people that develop certain things that are problematic for their other neighbors that they don't really like, but also it gives you the freedom to develop more naturally built structures, mm -hmm. kind of like what we're talking about here. Wouldn't it be too hard? I'm trying to think if we could even do that on this house. I mean, we probably could in theory, like we probably could. Like in the front on our living room wall, we could probably do that and make it look somewhat nice. But where I was going with that is there is some value to having uh, <laughs> uh, building codes, but then yes. we lose out on the ability to make some of these more natural structures. And so something that, you know, kind of got us in the talking about structures after you'd showed me your, your bees and like got to see the queen bee, which was my first time <laughs> seeing a queen bee. Um, was that we were talking about earthships. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I have a, I've had such an interest in them, though I've never seen one in real life. Because again, using the natural resources that are in our environment, as opposed to trying harder. Again, that complexity versus things being simple and using the ground uh, radiate, radiation, yeah. which you have a greenhouse that does this. I do that, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, uh There, you, there's a lot there. Yeah, to totally. <laughs> Where, wherever, uh, whichever thread you the, want to go the, with. Okay, building codes are are consumer protection devices. That is that is the reason for building codes. Mm -hmm. Is so that if I build a structure and if you buy it and it falls down, it was obviously a, a flaw. Mm -hmm. So so that there's a, there's there's. So, so the codes are there so that we have minimum building standards so that when the consumer buys a house, it meets those standards. Sure. That is, that is basically what they're for. But it does take away from the, the experimentation of different uh, ways of, of putting up buildings. Right. You know, uh, the straw bale houses, mm -hmm. the stack wood houses, the anything, and then of course, if something happens in a house, then you come back and you go, well, I need to sue somebody right. in order to recoup my, my investment. And, and so, and of course, if they're not around, I mean, that is the reason why of building codes. I mean, that's, that's a and, good it, value. And it's also frustrating too, because it is. then it requires that you have certain things purchased again. It like, oh. it keeps the commercial economy going in a way that is potentially detrimental to people, especially lower income people or people that are a little more creative and want to use the materials that they find on their land. Sure. No, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, it's, 
you know, Adobe, Pro, Adobe blocks. I mean, yeah, pros and cons. What, what a what a, what a great concept. But yeah, you you almost cannot do that because the Adobe freeze the moisture comes up from the ground mm. and it freezes and thaws and then they fall down after. Right. They don't last forever. Right. I mean, people are putting up plastic fences though. Yes. Kind of similar. I, they don't last forever. I don't even know if they last for a year and they got holes in them. It's like, okay, you they're, br they're... breathed wrong on it. Plus the sun, it just, ah, it's frustrating because it's like, <laughs> that's an acceptable structure to go up and we know it has a finite life. Yeah. Um, there were some folks on Redlands Mesa down in Hodgkiss a couple years ago that I spent some time doing uh, mud, sand, and water mm -hmm. walls. What is that called? Clay, clay oh, walls. Yeah, but it's, it's like a... Uh... It's built so it has some structure to mm -hmm. it. And we used, what, it was, what I liked about it was, is we used like old glass bottles yeah. as like part of the structure, the scaffolding, and you couldn't see them. And it was this beautiful, like, um, what I like about it is like, okay, this room we're in is pretty square in theory. <laughs> as we've done remodeling, we've learned it's not actually that square, but it's got the square, like, you know, round, you know, 90 degree corners. What I like about these natural buildings is you can get some like beautiful curvature mm -hmm. and some like more elegant, like design to it. Yeah. And it holds. Yeah. The rammed earth is another one of mm -hmm. those that, that like that, that you can't, um, th there's a lot of different people. People are not dumb. They have done a lot of different things over the, uh, you know, they, they, they have they have come to different s solutions to different problems yeah. over the eons, and it's it's amazing to. <laughs> but we're we're at this stage now, right? I mean, and I, I, I will say it again: pros and cons. Pros and cons, yes. It's like there's a lady I follow who's in I forget which country in Africa, but she has dung floors, and twice a year mm -hmm. in her village they redo their dung floors, and we would be like, oh, that's so unsanitary. Her house actually looks pretty damn clean yeah, I, compared to, you know, all the pet is. fur and crap that we have on here and like little plastics. And I, I would venture that it's the, cleaner. The dust bunnies in the corners, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some of those. Yeah. Mm hmm. So it's it, it's uh, there's a lot of judgment that can come from the natural building structures. Yeah. But I think that, again, that breathability when you have a yes. clay structure, it's it's a, it allows things to move a little more freely. Well, structures are in my mind, they, they, they take a, a personality of their own. Mm -hmm. they, they definitely do. Definitely. And, and some of the more uh, organic mm -hmm. structures just feel better because they, they are, do. they live different. Yeah. They breathe. They, 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 they operate differently. Yeah. When it's like, you've ever had like someone's shirt, you know, of a person you really loved that passed away and like it's like that's their shirt <laughs> like they wore that shirt all the time and it has their energy to it you know like you can tell mm -hmm. and even after a point you're like that was still grandma's shirt from 20 years ago <laughs> but it doesn't have quite the same essence as you know when she was wearing it you know 20 years previously and I feel like houses haunted houses this is like speaks to go. the haunted houses or like old psych wards or <laughs> torture chambers like any of it you can feel the like energy that something was not right yeah. here yeah, having built houses, I mean, they, they and that that uh, personality comes out of them as it as it progresses, sure. and all the people put their energy into it. I mean, it's creating; it, it's it, a project, it just like anything. Is. Yeah, you make a cake and you're pissed off. The cake might not might not raise properly because you were putting bad vibes into yeah. it. Like I'm using you mean because you're stomping the floor and exactly. when it, it fell. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm using these words that are more common in modern language, but there is there is quite a bit of truth and wisdom to to this and like how our attitudes affect things as we're putting them together. Yeah. And you know, this is one of the things that's so interesting to me about quote unquote inanimate objects is yeah, this house is technically not alive per se, the way you and I and these plants yeah, are, true. but it does have a, an, a, an essence to it yeah. that comes alive based on how you take care of it. Um, <laughs> am I going to share this? Yes. So one time I was, I was, used, I was on ma magic mushrooms and I was at a friend's house and it was a rental and um, I couldn't handle being in this house because I could tell that this house wasn't cared for. And not that my, my friend wasn't caring for it. They'd only lived there for mm -hmm. six months. But the owners of the home didn't care. There were cracks. 
in the foundation, the landscaping outside, like the whole house was just like needed TLC. And I had to get out of it because I was like, I can't be in this house that no one cares about. And then being outside felt so much better. And I feel like that's one of the value, valuable aspects of psychedelics is it kind of helps us tune in a little bit more to our environment, especially for those of us that may be a little more sensitive. I'm not sure if you've had any experiences like that. Have not. Have not. <laughs> yep. Some people, you know, yep, exactly. Um, but I can, I can identify with it, but no, I have not. Right. And it's like being more tuned in yes, with the yeah. environment. Exactly. Yeah. You, can, you don't need to have a psychedelic experience to be tuned in with no, your no, environment. No, no. But it does help if... Yeah, I would say our culture today is maybe different than when you grew up because we have so much crap technology that kind of hinders our ability to be tuned in with our environment, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I'm just an old fart. Yeah, well, <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> oh God, I just, yeah. But I appreciate t speaking with and like engaging with people from other generations because yeah. there is a little bit more, again, that wisdom that like, you know, your two-year-old granddaughter probably knows how to use an iPad better than you. Probably better than no, me, no too. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some negative downfalls to that as well. And like, you know, d development and missing out on the whole actual human connection with the yeah. actual world. Go play in the dirt. Yeah, go play in the dirt. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Make mud pies. Yes. I'll tell you what kind of mud makes the best mud pies. Yes. <laughs> we haven't had rain that makes best mud pies recently. Um, okay. Any other thoughts about building structures that you want to make sure people know about? Don't undo the blinders. Don't, yes, just absorb any and every opportunity that might be out there. Don't, don't, don't get stuck one direction or the other. Yeah. Be, be open to, and I'm not just in building or construction, but just in general. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. You just, just don't, Watch out for that because it's really easy for it to happen. For sure. Yeah, and it gets stuck and it's, yeah, yeah. it's the lack of creativity. Yeah. And we're, again, I'll say it again, we're fortunate to live in an area where there are people that are building earthship communities down yep. like in Alamosa area and Taos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's quite a few people in the North Fork, Delta County, um, on Redlands Mesa in Paonia that are doing natural building structures. A colleague of mine who's retired, her and her husband have been putting together a beautiful house and the craftsmanship is just, I haven't ever been in a house like that in my entire life, I don't think. And I helped a couple summers ago do um, clay and straw, like stuffed mm -hmm. walls to help with that radiation. And like there was a specific thickness and a specific tamping method that you had to do to get it so it was more structurally sound. And I'm going to guess it had something to do with this R value that we talked about because well, it was the exterior walls. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate in my building. I mean, I got to run the job on, on Dennis Weaver's Earth ship. Uh, I, I built a stackwood house down mm -hmm. in Molatha. Um, and at that point, Stackwood was actually came, coming out of, out of Delta County, which came from Canada 100 years ago. It's not new. None it, of these things we're talking about are New. None of these things are particularly new. No, they're no. just maybe a lost art. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they have, but fortunately, and that's why I was talking about the blinders, somebody looked in a different direction and, and went, okay, I can make that work for me. Yeah, exactly. And, make the old new again and make it relevant. And uh, what's the word I'm looking for? like a, a, acceptable in today's society. I mean, these like this, my colleague's house is absolutely gorgeous and they're using all of these old techniques mm -hmm. to make this house come to life. And you know, one of the comments I made <laughs> when I saw it and they're not done, I was like, it doesn't smell bad in here and it's a construction zone. <laughs> you ever been in a building that is being put together and it smells terrible? Yeah, well, they... <laughs> the materials they're using are cheap, expensive crap. Well, <laughs> that's, yes, that's... I know building materials are not cheap these days, but they are made from questionable material is what I, when I say that. Well, they, it is mass production. Exactly. And there's pros and cons to that. One of the benefits of mass production is it's more accessible, supposedly, mm -hmm. to lower income communities, supposedly. Yeah. Anyway, so let's see. We've got a little bit of time left. We should talk about bees if you're okay Let's talk that. about bees. Let's this, talk this, about this bees. Is, this is... Uh, October. Yeah. What's happening? Because I got into the beehive yesterday. I I looked at it. I didn't. I've already extract taken all the honey off and extracted it. I haven't um, uh, I haven't bottled it yet. But it's but it's off the hive. But this is the time of year whenever the winter bees are being 
laid the winter. The queen is laying the winter bees, mm -hmm. and the drones are getting kicked out because they don't want to feed them for the rest of the year. Um, so it's a real change in 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 the the colony as they're happening this time of year. So the queen does not mate in the winter time. No. And drones, I learned this recently, the drones are actually like copies of the queen. They're male. Dr drones are the male bees. They're male bees, but they're, they're, they're genetic copies of the, of the queen. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting I, I, compared I, I, to the I, worker bees. Because, well, I know that, the, the, okay, all bees, once the egg is laid, mm -hmm. that, that egg, depending on what it is fed, mm can either be a queen bee or, or a worker bee, the, because the worker bees are female. Mm -hmm. The male bees, or the drones, are, that egg is laid different. I mean, it, it, it's a different, but yes, I mean. Mm -hmm. It's not fertilized, there we go. That's the, yeah, that's yeah, the word yeah, I was yeah, looking for. Yeah. The drones are not fertilized Correct. compared to the worker bees, which are. Or maybe I have it the other way around. I think it's the other way around. Other way around, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, be, yeah. Mm -hmm. anyways, um, and, and Okay, bees are fascinating, and, and there's a whole bunch out there that because ju just the structure of the colony and how it evolves through the lifespan of the bees, how from the day they are they are hatched until they till they die, they all have a different job, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just it just repeats itself over and over and over, and it's mm -hmm. and it's all for the good of the colony. Right. Community. Community. So when yeah. you say the winter bees are being born right now. Mm -hmm. Do they have like thicker like fluff on okay. them? Fur? Winter, winter bees, no, winter bees, uh, let's start with the summer bee. The summer bee lives six weeks. Okay, well, that's not very long. Not very long. It, 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 it's, uh, it's, it spins like, it takes like roughly, and, and these are rough numbers, but, but it, it, it takes about three weeks for it to, in the hive till it till it's hatches. It spends another three weeks in the hive, and then it spends another anywhere between three and six weeks outside foraging. Okay. So it's, it's a real short time span, but its whole job is to go get, make, make the colony survive. Mm -hmm. Okay, the winter bee is to make the col colony survive, but, it's, but it stays within the confines of the hive. Okay. And it lives six months. Oh, wow. This bee is different. <laughs> okay. This bee is there to, to, you eat the honey, which is the energy that it, the, the carbohydrates that it needs in order to live, but it's there to generate heat so that the the hive does not freeze. Mm -hmm. That is its job. Okay. As opposed to foraging bees, this is this this winter bee is to make it live through the winter. So is there less winter bees than there are summer bees yes. typically? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Conservation yeah. of energy. Yeah, and they, they, they form a cluster. And within this cluster, the bees, by, they disconnect the wings muscles to their wings to where they don't have to have lots of room around them. But they sit there and they shiver those, shiver those muscles, mm -hmm. just like when we get cold. Yeah, it and, generates and heat. And it generates heat. Mm -hmm. And the, the warm ones in the middle... Gener work their way to the outside and ones that are cold on the outside work their way to the center cool. and it continues all winter long. Okay. That hive out there is 95 degrees in the middle of winter. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> cool. It's, but it's done by the bees shivering their, their, their muscles mm -hmm. and consuming the honey that the bees, summer bees put away f so they can survive. And is that something you'd like to make sure that they have is some of the honey reserves? Because I know oh, they got to have. Yeah. If they don't, they starve to death. Yeah. And and if it gets too cold, to where this cluster can't move from where the honey is stored in the hive, mm -hmm. if it because it has to move around in order to consume that honey, and right. and they don't move, if it gets really cold and never warms back up. Right. That makes sense. And so they will starve to death with honey right on the other side of the. Right, it's too cold to move. And the problem that we have in Colorado is we get like sometimes really warm days yep. and then it gets really cold. So we have some pretty big temperature fluctuations. Yes. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you do any kind of things like external, like put tents or like okay. insulation on the bee, beehives? I have, I'm only in my sixth, seventh year of beekeeping. Okay, so there's a lot I don't know. Sure. <laughs> there's a lot. Um, I have gone to 
putting what they call a candy board, which is basically a sugar, hard sugar board that sits on top so that should they have to move from one side to the other as they come up and across, they have that store to move. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's like having someplace, an extra spot that they can go to in their, in their movement that they don't, that they can, because they will, they will eat the honey first. Sure. But the, the sugar stores are there as an emergency backup. Mm -hmm. But also on top of that, because honey is 17% moisture. Okay. So as they consume this, this honey, they're, they're expelling water vapor. What happens when it's really cold is that that water vapor condenses on the cold surfaces inside of the hive. Okay. Both inside and on the top. So now it's, you've got this, this frost, basically, mm -hmm. that has, has developed, or the, the condensation that is against the, the hive. And the sun comes out and, and warms the top of it, which is because, and because moisture always goes to the warmer side of things, because sure. warm air can, can, can hold more moisture. Right. And, and heat goes up, so right. you end up with more of a, of, a, a, a moisture problem on the inside of the hive at the top. Okay. I have gone to where I put in what they call a quilt board, which is nothing more than a frame with some fabric underneath it with a sawdust layer in it to absorb that moisture. Got it. Because if that moisture starts to drip and rain on the hive, they get wet and they die. Right. Yeah, bugs <laughs> so don't So if you can keep wet. them dry, mm -hmm. they stay warm. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. that, those are the things that I've started doing. Okay. That and... and Trying to do some kind of aurora mite. Um, aurora mites are this little parasite bugs that bees get mm -hmm. that introduce uh, viruses and stuff to the colony, and that also kills them. Yep. That's that's when you talked about the collapse. Yeah, that's a a lot of that comes from introduction of the varora mite and what the mites introduce to the colony. Right, they t makes it. Um susceptible so yes so w what do you like to do to help support the bees so they don't get the mite or if they do get the mites how are you treating that i there, there's several different uh approved messages or methods mm -hmm. to to control mites basically we're, we're using an insecticide on an in, on an insect, right, <laughs> right. So you have to. It's tricky. So it, it's real, mm -hmm. real iffy here. But there are uh, there's lots of different things that that the that the mites don't tolerate that are still don't get absorbed into the the honey or the or the wax or or into the system mm -hmm. that that work to to kill them off. Okay. Uh, bees clean them up to a certain extent, but they're they're a they're a nasty little booger. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I understand. I mean, the colony collapse is pretty severe. Yeah, yeah. it's like dead. It, it's it's a big deal. Everybody. The, um, some things that I've heard about being used: formic acid and mm -hmm. oh, what's the other one? It's another oxalic acid. Oxalic acid. Yeah. Yep. Are those things that you've used I've in the used, past? I've used both. Yes. Cool. Yeah, I don't think there. There's some. Uh, okay, most everything evolves. As we so, learn more, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, that's so, life. So, and they develop resistances to different things, and so you need to be able to to not use the same methods all the time, so that sure. the, so that you're always using even something different, even though it may be on some kind of a regular schedule, that that the mites don't develop a resistance to. Sure, that makes sense. Have you found that your hives can maintain, like they? Do you have to treat every season, or do your hives like they built up a tolerance to it, and like they're okay, like they have a? There's a lot of schools of thought on that one. Sure, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll you tread know, lightly. Do, do we do we let them die, and then you only propagate the the strong ones? It's a it's a great thought. A great. I mean, it'd be wonderful. It would work that way. Yeah. But it it doesn't seem to be that the the viruses and the stuff that, that the mites are, are party to are, are more, I think they're stronger yeah. than, 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 the, than what, what the bee has developed to date. Yeah. Not that they're, they're, cause they're also evolving. For sure. Absolutely. And so we'll kind of go slight on a different path. One of the things that 
I noticed about when I came out to your house was you live on the <laughs> north side of town. West. West side. East, east side, excuse me, east side. God, my directions. Yeah, really. That Sorry. Way. That way. <laughs> but you live away from the agricultural yes, side of town. Yes, I do. And there's a huge value, again, thinking about yep. colony collapse unrelated to the mites, living away from agricultural. Sure, yes. You want to share Absolutely. with people what that is? Well, it's... Okay, I'm a farm kid, okay? Mm -hmm. so let's, let's go. And it's a real juggle with the chemicals that everybody seems to think... We, we, we're in a sweet corn yeah. community. Yeah. Okay. When, when I was a kid, I mean, you know, you went out there and you went to the corn patch and it had worms in the ears of corn. You cut them off and it was no big deal. Right. Today's consumer will not buy that corn ear with a worm in it. I know. So what options do, does the farmer have? So, so there are chemicals out there that are very short-lived. Mm -hmm. they, they, that will kill the moth that lays the egg that has the worm that's in your sweet corn that you don't want to buy. <laughs> yep. So that there's a, but that also kills the bees. Mm -hmm. Now we have, they're very good in this, in this here to where they will call you up or, or send you a text message or do something so that if they're going to be spraying the fields close to where the bees are, they'll let you know. Yeah. Which is, I mean, you know, great. Yeah. But then you have to go out and close them up so the bees can't get out of the hive while that chemical is is working. Yep. So I yes, I fortunately live away from that that side of things. I don't have I don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But you also deal with the people that are next door that find an aphid on their on their rose bush and drown the thing. Yeah. <laughs> because the farmer, he's using, he doesn't want to use, it's costing him money. Definitely. To do this. Mm -hmm. But he can't do it without having that, that return on that crop. Yeah. The, the poor aphid that gets drowned in, in some pesticide, I think actually probably does more harm yeah. to, to most bees. Uh, and that's just a, that's just a personal... Well, here's something I noticed. is So you live out near the canal where we sometimes yep. take our dogs. Yep. And one morning we, were, we went out to the canal and there was this person that was just going to town spraying. And I don't really know what they were spraying for. Maybe thistle or maybe the hound's tongue, the, the little things that get stuck. And we were gone for a couple hours. We come back. They're still spraying. Yeah. They're outside. And they're spraying, and you can, you can smell the cloud of pesticide that they're spraying. They were spraying so much, and it was a small area, maybe a little bit bigger than this room we're in. And that's, you know, that's an interesting thought of like, well, the farmer doesn't really want to have to use this, and I know there was some pretty big devastation in Olathe this summer, and some of the farmers oh. are like, I'm, I'm done. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I, I don't know I can do this next year. Like, it's, it's really, we, our community is heavily dependent on agricultural. And the sweet corn has quite the marketing, you know, yeah. through, throughout the country. Anybody knows, like, oh, Latha sweet corn. So I think that there's some val validity to what you're saying. It's like that person, Joe Schmo, not a farmer, and they're out there spraying, you know, five gallons of pesticides or whatever they're spraying that was like a chemical cloud in two hours. Yeah. And they're yeah. standing in it. <laughs> well, <laughs> and it could have been pesticide, could have been herbicide. Yeah, some kind of herbicide. side. Yeah, yeah. Could, yeah. yeah, could have been either the... the the weeds or, or the, or the mm -hmm. bugs. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. It is tough. But, but that farmer cannot, he cannot do what he does, which is, which is and it's in your blood, to, to uh, produce a crop by putting in, working the ground, putting the fuel, the, the equipment, everything into it, and not get anything, anything out of it. Yeah. You, you can't, that that's you will fail yeah and there's some there's some schools of thoughts on monoculture and that and i know that yes in something you said specifically with the mites is like you got to kind of like have a little trickery you got to kind of rotate what you're doing and we find something that works and i know with with big chemical like it's just like oh we'll just spray more next year we'll just spray more and i know that the particular farmer i'm thinking of that really like he was in Colorado, he had an article in Colorado Public Radio, or Public, what, 
whatever. Yeah. <laughs> D David Harold did tuxedo corn. And he's like, yeah, 1,500 cases when I've usually done like 250,000 cases. Yeah. And that was like most of the way through corn season by that point. And that's pretty devastating on a, I think he's a fourth generation corn farmer. Yeah, well, this valley is interesting because yeah. when my grandparents moved here down on California Mesa in, in the 40s, there was a, there was a, a vegetable packing plant in Delta. Mm -hmm. There was Skyland Foods who put up, but the vegetable place put up uh, all kinds of, of vegetables. Um, there was a seed packing plat, plant. Wow. There was Skyland Foods who put up the cherries and the, and the apples and the, but those things are gone. Yeah. And no, we are, but, but in, we have a wonderful valley because you can grow anything here Pretty much. and have over the, over mm -hmm. the, the, the generations of farmers. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty amazing. I mean, Bread basket of Colorado, right where we're it, at. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Very unique, and it all has to do with water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we also are very unique in that, in that regard. We do. We have a lot of fresh water out here. Well, the, the, the tunnel the, that, that delivers that water from the Gunnison, from the Black Canyon mm -hmm. over to this side of the uh, valley. It's impressive. Yes, it's some really forward thinking back in the early 1900s. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Delta is kind of a sleepy town compared to what it used to be, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. There's not a lot of warehousing manufacturers. There's a couple food producers or like food packing plants that mm -hmm. I'm familiar with down in the North Fork, but they're super yeah. small scale. Yeah, the apples, the orchard stuff. Yeah. But, you know, gee whiz, Montrose used to be the, the hub of orchards. <laughs> yeah. And it, what do you think has shifted? Is just like people's uh, priorities and jobs they want to do? No, I think it's some way to make a living. Yeah. You know? you, we used to have a sugar factory in Delta. There were sugar beets raised all over the valley. Mm -hmm. Not um, anymore. It's I don't gone. even know where that factory was. Does it even still those, exist? Those real tall silos that are down there, mm -hmm. those, used to, those were put up the tail end of the, when Holly Sugar had the, was making sugar, mm -hmm. and they filled those silos full of sugar wow. at, the, at the, I don't know, the last few years of, of the existence of the factory. I worked in the factory mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> way back when. Yeah, I mean, it's part of the community. And it's yeah. when you live in a farm community, which I'm not from a farm community originally, but my interest in local food and like fresh food yeah. came about when I was in college and I had lettuce and I've shared this story before and I was like, oh my God, lettuce actually has flavor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I grew up eating iceberg lettuce, which is just crunchy water, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but it's not as good as like, wow, this lettuce has like... A, a flavor to it. Yeah. I don't know how to describe it. If you haven't had fresh lettuce, you're missing out. There's lots of different kinds. There's lots of different kinds. You get some spicier, some sweeter, crunchier, a little more green tasting. Yeah, it's uh, anyway. Um, and I was like, wow, there's, I want to know more about local production of f farms. Um, and I interviewed a guy a little while ago um, down from the North Fork and 65, 67 is the average age of a farmer today. Yeah. Um, that's a, farming is a hard job. Ranching it's, is a hard job. It, yes. And this is scary to me as a, as a young millennial that's saying, hey, like our farmers are aging out of the system and, you know, they're having to make these decisions on like my equipment. And, you know, there's, there is a movement towards more, towards organic and like not just the government certification, but actually like taking care of mm -hmm. the soil and all of these things oh. and preserving water. I mean, we kind of have to at this point. We're, we're running out of resources. You will not find anybody that cares more about the soil than the farmer. Hundred percent. It, it, you know, I think they get a bad rap. It, I, yeah. And it, and it. You know about the soil and food forum that happens in January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I've been most impressed by that is like the fourth generation farmers in Delta that are blown away by simple things. <laughs> It's like I put manure, and I'm not trying to be a oh. jerk. It's like I put manure on, and like, oh my God, my corn is twice, twice as big as it was. Well, fortunately, we have chicken farms mm -hmm. <laughs> who who use the grains and the stuff from the valley. Yep. To in the production of chickens, which in turn put out the the manure, which you can scatter back out on your field, which is the old way of doing. Hundred percent before it's the like, before the, World yeah. War II. And 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 the <laughs> and the the rotation of crops. I mean, it's but. Farmers know more about this than anybody else out there. Totally. <laughs> it's, but it became a lost art when it, it became it this easy, oh, I'll just do well, this application. Easy. Well, costly. But they... 
the, the, the margins of, of making a profit yeah. have come down. I mean, the, 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 the price of, of grain that they get from, from a bushel of, of wheat today is not that much different than it was, you know, 50 years ago. No, it's horrid. So you have, they, the only way that they can do that is to put more f commercial fertilizers on in order to have the, the yield mm -hmm. to take care of buying the equipment and the diesel and everything else oh, that yeah. it takes to run it. In order to in order to make a profit, so that they can sleep indoors and eat regular. Absolutely, because they have the same problems as everybody else. They do, and I think people forget this, and people like that don't don't know farming. And I'm not saying I'm an expert by any means, but I'm under, not either. I understand and appreciate the challenge that our farmers have ahead of themselves and the work that they put yeah. in. Um, when uh, when broccoli is six dollars a pound, people are like I don't really want to pay that. I'm like, you just paid $5 for your coffee, but you're not willing to pay $6 a pound for broccoli that your neighbor grew? That seems kind of interesting to me. Well, and that's, you used to grow broccoli here. Mm -hmm. Lots of it. Yeah, I believe it. Um, are you familiar with Gabe Brown? No. He's a farmer out of North Dakota, I think. Maybe South Dakota. He lost his crop multiple years in a row to like a freak hailstorm. And so by, he's talked about quite regularly, he's written a couple books now, because his farm turned from, you know, your typical application of uh, synthetic fertilizers and the cost with that, like it's cost, oh, like it's, 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 it's not free. No, it's... Like, and so he did not have any profit for three years, waiting for the insurance, you know, I'm still waiting, still waiting for the insurance from his crop um, being completely destroyed. And uh, this, he's talked about quite often at the Soil and Food Forum. And his farm is beautiful now and his profit margin is substantially more by using these old practices mm -hmm. he saves a lot of money it's better for the environment oh. and his land is like his before and after pictures in just a few short years are astronomically different cover crops yes cover exactly crops are, you know and, and you simple know, they, they, they are they're adopting them more and more here yeah Exactly. That, that those cover crops that can pull those nutrients from deeper in the ground and, and work it around. And, and protect and, and the, the soil in the winter. The microorganisms and all mm -hmm. the rest of that. I mean, most all this is a way over my head. Cause, cause it's not, though, because you understand it. You lived it. You grew up on well, a farm. I grew up on a farm, but, I am not, but I'm not a farmer. Mm -hmm. so, so the practices of t have gotten away from me because I'm... I'm You're not in it. I was a carpenter. Okay? Yeah. I was, hey. a, I was a carpenter. So... We need we need all of it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> anyways, that's yeah. But, but yeah, no, it's very near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I really appreciate having this conversation with you and getting to learn a little bit more about the history in Delta County and like it used to be quite the thriving farm community and it oh. still is, but it's on a different level now than it once yeah. was. Um, and we are super fortunate to live in an area with access to some really high quality, we delicious are. produce that has flavor that's not just coming from Mexico and yeah. no dig on Mexico. However, no. I like to shake my farmer's hand and know them. Yeah. Um, if my listeners want to find you, how can they find you, get in touch with you? Well, I'm at the farmer's market in the wintertime. Okay. <laughs> farmer's market in Montrose, which in Montrose. is indoor in the Centennial building? No, no, it's, it's outside. Oh, it's, is it's, it? It's in the plaza. Okay. Um, 970-209-6132. Okay. I'll, I'll let people know. Like, would you be open to people coming and seeing your tram yeah, wall yeah. and your cool yeah. greenhouse? Because it'll be up and running. Like, you probably, your it plants is, are probably now. bigger now. I got beets about that big around. Nice. That's Which, great. Which, the market opens on the uh, 2nd of November, I think. Okay. So, so we got a couple week breaks. I think last Saturday was yeah. the last one for the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, we talked about a, you know, a few different things on this episode, guys. We talked about passive solar and active solar. We also, I also learned something new about the heat solar, where you can <laughs> hold energy and in either glycol, which is what sugar, a sugar substance. Glycol is a propylene glycol. Propylene glycol. But it, but it's a food safe. I mean, it, it's in a lot of different. It's foods. in a lot of foods. It, yes. Yeah, I have some questionable things about right. it. But, but, <laughs> Basically, all antifreeze do is they keep the water that's in there from expanding, which is yeah. what breaks pipes. Right. That, that's antifreeze. all it is. Simple. Yep. Yeah. And the trom walls, which have, again, not a new technology, but bringing the old back to save ourselves a little bit of money and uh, be a little more clever with our resource use. Um, and we talked a little bit about bees and the difference between spring bees, or excuse me, summer bees, which have a very short life compared to the winter bees. 
and the need in Colorado to have some kind of like maybe maybe it's not just a need in Colorado but our weather in Colorado is as such that we have warm days and very cool nights and that temperature fluctuation is what can kill bees in addition to mites and there's a couple treatments you got to be flexible we mm -hmm. kind of got off on a little tangent about <laughs> corn <laughs> you know like we, this is a cool conversation in my mind, Glenn, because you know we get to bring the history of the valley and um, really start building more community, it's which is something valley. that's very important to me with sharing the wisdom from our elders in the community, but also, again, keeping things simple that we make things so complex as humans and it's kind of dumb and frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> um, my next guest is a patient of a fellow colleague of mine whose family's lives was completely changed by doing the Carol Food Intolerance Evaluation, something that only a handful of NDs in Colorado use as a tool. Um, I know it made a big difference in my quality of life. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening in. Sounds like Thank you.